We're looking today at the final topic or the final lesson in this unit, which is called the de Broglie wavelength. Sometimes it's pronounced de Broglie. I'm told that it's actually pronounced de Broglie. It doesn't really matter. We're going to be calculating something called the de Broglie wavelength of a particle. And when I say a particle, I mean something with mass. So yes, we are going to be talking about things that are particles, that are true particles, not photons, electrons, protons, that have a wavelength and what that wavelength of a particle means. So we're going to be calculating de Broglie wavelengths and also explaining what it means. And the explanation is just as important as the calculation. There's a picture of Louis de Broglie. French physicist, I have never seen a picture of this guy where he isn't smiling. He's just this happy guy. And he asked a question. He looked at the Compton effect, which says, and I'll show you what this says in a second in your notes, but the Compton effect says photons, which have no mass and are not real particles, have momentum. So the Compton effect says Things that do not have mass, things that are not real particles, behave like real particles in that they have momentum. So he asked, if that's the case, maybe it's possible for real particles to behave like waves. The Compton effect demonstrates that waves behave like particles, basically. You know, that's the whole notion of a photon, is that it's, it's a part of an electromagnetic wave, but it's a quantized particle of energy. So is it possible for a real particle which has mass to have wave properties and therefore whatever it means behave like a wave? Can particles like marbles behave like waves? And by the way, just before we get into it, you know, yes, they can behave like waves, but it doesn't mean they travel through space in a wave-like fashion. That's not what it means. So if you have that notion in your head, just relegate it to the garbage bin because it's not a valid interpretation. What de Broglie did is he took Compton's formula for the momentum of a photon, which is valid. He demonstrated, Compton demonstrated that it works. And he rearranged it for lambda. And he said, the wavelength according to this formula is Planck's constant divided by the momentum. But if it's a real particle, Momentum is purely defined in terms of mass and speed, or velocity, but we're not worried about vectors here. So what he put in for P is this. And what we just did here, which is to take Compton's formula, P equals H over lambda, rearrange it for lambda to get this formula, lambda equals H over P, and substitute MV in to get lambda equals H over MV. This is a formula you need to know how to use, but it's not on your formula sheet. So you need to know when we're talking about a wavelength of a real particle with mass, which you still don't know what it means, that you have to go through this or memorize this formula. Alberta education has gotten in the habit of, on diploma exams, giving students the formula when they need to use it. I don't know why they don't just put it on the formula sheet then. If they feel that way, just put it on the formula sheet. But anyway, it's not. So this is the de Broglie wave hypothesis. A hypothesis is kind of a generalized prediction that de Broglie is hypothesizing or predicting that real particles, particles with mass, do have a wavelength that can be calculated with this formula. I don't think he lived to see the proof of this, but it is true. It's basically an argument of symmetry, that the universe is nice and organized and symmetric. So the photoelectric effect and the Compton effect tell us light is a, way, a particle. Let me repeat that. The photoelectric effect and the Compton effect tell us that light, which has no mass, behaves like a particle. On the other hand, Diffraction and interference demonstrate that light, which has no mass, can behave like a wave. So what he's saying is if things without mass can behave like things with mass, particles, or behave like waves, then maybe 
real particles with mass can also behave like real particles and waves. Maybe the universe is weird, and we've developed physics around this boundary where we say things over here are particles and things over here are waves, but maybe they're all the same kinds of things, which is a really wild notion. So can real particles have momentum? Yes. Okay, so let me back up. If, if light particles can have momentum or behave like waves, then why can't real particles have momentum and behave like waves? So we're going to do a calculation. This is called wave-particle duality. We're going to do a calculation. We're going to calculate the de Broglie wavelength of a 1,250-kilogram car moving at 30 meters per second. It's a little bit over 100 kilometers per hour. It's something we're familiar with. And we're going to find the de Broglie wavelength as well of an electron traveling at 2 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. And then we're going to talk about what these numbers mean. So I'm not going to be writing anything down. You're going to write down a few things, and we're going to do a calculation or a set of calculations. All I've done is I've summarized the information here, which you don't even really need to write down because it's right there. And if you look up here for a second, here's where we start. We go to the momentum formula that Compton developed. We say if I rearrange that, it's lambda equals h over p. And since P is MV, because these are real particles, you understand I can get away with calling a car a particle, even though it's multiple particles. I'm treating it as a single particle. So what you need to do is calculate these two things. And just like when we were dealing with photons and that formula, electron volts are not welcome in any of our calculations here. So I would like everybody please and thank you, to calculate both of those wavelengths, whatever they mean. And I get for the wavelength of the car, 1.8 times 10 to the negative 38. And for the wavelength of the electron, about 3.6 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. So are we in agreement on those numbers? So we are asked to explain why, whatever this means, why we would never see evidence of a car behaving like a wave. Okay, so you need to follow along carefully here. What does it mean to say something is a wave? It means that it can do things like diffract and interfere. That's it. That's the checklist for something being a wave. If it can diffract and interfere, then it is a wave. And we will see the diffraction and if we have two openings, we would see interference. So we need to also remember that diffraction doesn't happen unless the wave passes through an opening smaller than the wavelength. So if you want to see diffraction of a wave where the wavelength is 2 meters, you need to pass it through an opening smaller than 2 meters. So we need to pass the car through an opening 1.8 times 10 to the negative 38 meters in size. And I asked, I still remember years and years ago, the student was brilliant, and they just thought of this a different way. I said, well, why is that not possible? And this student said, because those size openings don't exist. And he was right. There is no opening in the universe that small. Because of molecular motion, you can't get it stable at that distance. There's just going to be a blur of atoms. And the student wasn't really thinking logically, because even if you did have an opening that size, what's the problem? The car's not going to fit. So we had this discussion, and the same student said, OK, well, why can't we, and this is just a bonus to this lesson. I think it's interesting because it stumped me when he said this. Why can't we use this formula? And he was reasoning this way. Let's take an opening that's three meters wide. Will a car fit through an opening that's three meters wide? Yes. So he said, why don't we just find a speed 
that will give us a de Broglie wavelength of three meters. And I, I think he had me stumped for a minute. Well, let's calculate this. Let's calculate what this speed would be. This is how the formula would rearrange if we use three meters. So we're going to calculate how fast the car would have to be moving to have a de Broglie wavelength of three meters so that we could build an apparatus that it could go through and we can see what happens. And it's right now, this was about 15 to 20 years ago, it's right now in the discussion with the student in the class that I realized what the issue was and some of you were realizing. Three meters and also divided by the mass of the car. Was it 1250? Yeah. So I'm getting the speed. Okay. So let's think about this logically. We have our opening that is three meters wide. I have my car, which I'm not going to draw as a car. I'm just going to draw it as a rectangle. And it's just going to fit through there. But the length of this car is maybe four meters. Uh, that's 12 feet. That's about a length of a, some car has got to be that long. So what we want to do is send the cars through this opening to see them diffract on the other side, whatever that means. But it's going to be moving at about 10 to the negative 37 meters per second. What's the problem here, Alex? Do you know? Does anybody know what the problem with doing this experiment is? If you have the, the quantized energy, is that too small of a speed for you to actually be tracked? That is, and you're talking about Planck distance and all that stuff that you may have read about. I don't want to go there. You want, so you go, okay, go, and the car starts going. And you're going to wait for the car to make it through the opening. Well, the car's got to travel four meters, doesn't it? One car, four meters to get through. And it's moving at 10 to the negative 37 meters per second. So how long does it take? How long are you going to be standing there waiting for the car to go through? Well, a long time. Right? It doesn't work. And the, you could just see the disappointment in the student's face because they thought they discovered something. They really did. And then it was like, oh, of course. So if I take four meters and divide by this many meters per second, whoops, I take four meters and divide by this many meters per second, it's that many seconds. And we are dealing with, a, okay, well, let's divide by 60. It's this many minutes. Let's divide by 60, it's this many hours. Let's divide by 24, it's that many days. You, your brain can't cope with large numbers like this. Let's divide by 365.25, not that it's going to matter, to get the number of years. And I've kind of run out of units of time to divide by, except I can divide by the age of the universe which we believe to be approximately 15 billion years. It's this many lifetimes of the universe you'd be waiting for that one car to make it through. Okay? So the important lesson here is, well, there's a couple of important lessons. You will never, and you can write, write this down, you will never see a de Broglie wavelength of a car because it can't fit through the opening. Whether you can get that size opening or not, it can't fit through the opening. And, and if you want to say, well, can't we change it to get a bigger opening, then you're going to have to be going slow enough that you will never get a chance in your lifetime to experience it, whatever it is. But, but everybody, this distance of 10 to the negative 10 meters is approximately the distance between nickel atoms in a crystal of nickel. And it turns out when you shine a beam of electrons, shine, when you fire a beam of electrons at nickel, you get an interference pattern. And I want to show you what this means. And this is by far one of the strangest things in physics. 
So you're just going to be sitting back and observing for a while because this is not in your notes. I'm about to show you what waves versus particles look like in terms of diffraction through openings. So we already know, everybody, that when you have a wave going through a single opening, it diffracts, which means it spreads out. And these ripples that you're seeing below the barrier should be familiar. You should understand what it means. But the most important thing, I don't know why my energy is formatted that way, but the most important thing is you get a distribution of energy where most of the energy is directly across from the opening. And as you get to the left and the right of the opening, you get less and less energy, and it peters out. Okay? And if I open the other opening instead, I get the same thing, and that's a fact. But when you open two openings, you do not get this distribution of energy. Right? That doesn't happen. And this, there's nothing mystical or mysterious about this. We went through this when we learned about interference you get this. And the diagram I put there may not look that great, but it was what I was able to create in a graphing program. It probably drops off from the maximum to the n equals 1 to the n equals 2. It probably drops off more rapidly. But you get the idea, right? You get an interference pattern. So what about particles? And if you look at the top of the screen here, it says particles with mass moving down. And I'm going to demonstrate to you what particles behaving like particles looks like. You're going to get a pile of marbles across from that opening. right? You're not going to get a marble over here. You're not going to get a marble over here. And we're neglecting the possibility that the marbles bounce off the edges. That's not what we're talking about. There's nothing, I mean, that's common sense, isn't it? So you get a, a distribution of energy. And to call it a distribution is maybe unfair. You get a lump of energy. The reason why I've got kind of a curve there with the distribution is the opening is thick. So you know, the likelihood of a marble hitting closer to the center is probably higher than just clearing the edge. But that's not the point. If I open this one, I get that. So if I open both, I get that, right? And that's true for golf balls, or for marbles, or for cars, or for oranges, for any particles that we encounter in a day-to-day -day life. What about particles behaving like waves? So I'm talking here about electrons, and I'm talking about what really happens. I'm not talking about what we think happens. I'm talking about what really happens when you use small particles with observable de Broglie wavelengths. When these particles go through one opening, you do get a pile of particles. They do not behave like waves. They don't. That's a fact. So you get a distribution of energy. When they go through the other opening, same thing. Still with me? When they go through two openings, That doesn't happen. Those openings can be a meter apart. It doesn't happen. So if I cover up one of the openings, say the opening on the left, I cover it up, this is where they land. If I cover up the one on the right, this is where they land. If I don't cover any of them, they do not land in this relative position. They do that. And if you're, if you're sitting there and going, yeah, okay, then you don't understand what I'm saying. This does not make sense. It shouldn't make sense. There's a quote by Niels Bohr that says, if anybody thinks they can think about and understand quantum mechanics without being confused, and this is a form of quantum mechanics, all they're demonstrating is they don't understand the first thing about quantum mechanics. It's It's confusing. Or they're a genius, and it just makes sense to them. What ha and this is the weird thing. You send them through one at a time. I want to go through this because I think it's amazing. 
So you have these two openings and you have two electron guns. And we have done this, not we, I'm not going to put myself in the group, but physicists have done this. They have two electron guns connected to a computer that randomly fires gun at a time, one electron at a time, and it's random. The computer is set to randomly pick a gun and fire through which opening. And they fire the first electron, and all they do is they fire one electron, and they hit pause on the computer, and they observe where it lands. There's a phosphorescent screen there, and it lights up showing the flash of the electron, and they put a mark there. And then they go, well, let's go for lunch. And they leave. And they come back an hour later, and they go, well, let's turn it on again. Let's fire one more electron. And it lands there. And they go, oh, it's quitting time. They go home. Actually, it's vacation. They come back three weeks later. They fire another electron. These electrons are going through at different times, and the times can be separated by weeks or years. Years, it could be. And over time, what happens is you get an image revealed. And it starts building up. So it's not like shining the light through the diffraction grating and you immediately see all of them. It's the equivalent of firing one photon at a time. And if it still does not make sense to you, then that's good. If it's still something that's obvious to you, then I've failed because I'm not explaining to you how weird this is. And it gets weirder. Because physicists can be pretty smart. So, first of all, these equations work. If you calculate the de Broglie wavelength with de Broglie's formula, and you do an experiment with electrons and measure the same stuff that we measured with the laser, but you do it here, it works, it matches. But I want to show you something. This is bizarre. This is absolutely bizarre. It's, it's the worst thing in the world to try to wrap your head around, I think. I want you to notice that we get the electrons are streaming down. We get this interference pattern. Yes? And by the way, the interference pattern looks like this over time. And this is sped up. This is actual animation from a computer download of data from an experiment. So that's what happens. You get this, these bands of light and dark. So. You're getting an interference pattern. I want you to notice there's an electron detector there. And physicists are smart. They said, well, let's, let's find out what's happening when they go through the openings. So they look at the openings. They point electron detectors at the openings to find out which opening the electron goes through to find out what's happening. And as soon as, see the switch here? It's off. The electron detector is not doing anything. They turn it on, and the electrons behave like particles. That's freaky, man, isn't it? It gets worse, because even if the electron detector is off, and I don't have an animation for this, they set it up so that it's not random. They set up the computer program. So that when, while it can still be random, the, the pick the electron gun, that's the random part. But when the electron gun on the right is picked, there's a circuit that closes the opening on the left. Okay? So it, when the electron, when they know the electron goes through the one on the right, they're not looking at it, they just know it has to go through the one on the right because they've closed the opening on the left. And then when it fires through the one on the left, they automatically close the one on the right. They might as well be looking at it, because as soon as you know which opening it goes through, it will not produce a wave. So think about that. It goes from here, where both openings are open all the time, to here, where what's happening is they're closing the opening of the where the electron is not going. It's going through the right, they close the left. Well, sorry, I'm not going to behave like a wave anymore. So the two openings still have to be open, even though the electron's only going through one of them. And we observe this. And as I said, this is the important part, forgetting about the weirdness, 
de Broglie's formula matches the double slit formula that we've already tested for visible light. So de Broglie is right. Any questions? Uh, many questions, I'm sure. Does anybody have any questions they would like to ask me? Richard Feynman uh, was a Nobel Prize winning physicist in the last century. He, he surpassed Einstein in terms of his abilities and, and his thinking skills. But he was also an amazing teacher. Like People would clamor to try to get into his lectures in post-secondary. And if you get a chance to watch YouTube videos of him, he's just an amazing communicator with regards to physics. Um, there are lectures you can find him lecturing online. Uh, he's long since passed away. But you can also find just interviews of him where people are just asking him questions. He's sitting in a chair answering questions. And his ability to explain things was amazing. And when he taught the de Broglie wavelength kind of idea in quantum mechanics in many of his famous lectures, this is a quote. This is an actual quote from him. Don't like it? This is, the, this is what he would say. I can't lie to you and tell you the universe is this nice place that everything makes sense. I'm going to tell you the way things are. And this thing we've been talking about is the way things are. It's, it's, that's a, a fact. Don't like it? Go somewhere else. Find another universe to live in. And that was his quote. And it's a great quote because the universe is just a bizarre place. All right, we have what I believe is one question to do. No, two. Electrons are accelerated to a particular speed and directed to a crystal which acts as a diffraction grating. The distance between the atoms in the crystal is this number, and this number is D in Young's double slit formulas. So the, the atoms, we, we can't manufacture, well, I don't know, maybe we can with nanotechnology now, but traditionally you can't manufacture a diffraction grating with that D. But you can use nature crystals in an atom lattice as having that distance for D. We are asked to find the angles at which the first and second order maxima occur on the interference pattern. I just want to make sure. You know when you did the lab with the laser and you measured the distance between the n equals 1 and the n equals 1 and you found that angle, theta, for n equals 1? That's what we're talking about. It's just they're not spots of light. They are piles of electrons that accumulate over the course of the experiment. Well, what we're missing is lambda because lambda equals d sine theta over n so how do we find lambda? Well, it's a de Broglie wavelength. What we do is we say the momentum, and from here on in, everyone, I'm going to refer to this formula not as Compton's formula. I'm going to refer to it as the wave-particle duality formula. You can use it the way it is right now to find momentum of a photon. Or you can take that coin and look at the other side of the coin. And use it to find the wavelength of a particle. I, I think of wave-particle duality as a coin that has two sides. Photons behaving like particles. Other side, particles behaving like waves. And this, of course, is H over mv. So we can calculate the wavelength. And then we can put it into Young's double slit formula and calculate the angles. I cut it off. Alex, in a nice clear voice, can you tell me what the speed of the electrons were? 3.5 times 10 to the 6. 3.5 times 10 to the 6. So I'm going to take Planck's constant, h. Thank you. Planck's constant divided by m 
divided by 3.5 times 10 to the 6. By the way, you know in the Compton formula that we just finished reviewing, there's that H over MC. This is H over MV. Don't, con don't get them confused. In Compton's delta lambda formula, there's H over MC. This is H over MV. Um, this is the wavelength of the electrons. I better double check. Anybody else getting that? Uh, you know, I think even just taking physics, even if you're not in math right now, taking physics at the 30 level, your math skills have increased or improved. I, I don't think there's any problem with everybody saying sine of theta equals n lambda over d. So all we have to do is take 1 times lambda over d inverse sine and then 2 times lambda over d inverse sine and get our answers. So when n is 1, I can just take lambda divided by d and take the inverse sine, 1.65 degrees. These angles are typically very, very small for x-ray diffraction. I misspoke for electron diffraction. So 1.65 degrees. Because the angles are very small, we would expect that second angle to be twice as great, and it will be. So this time I'm going to take 2 times the wavelength divided by d. inverse sine, so you get about 3.31 degrees. Any questions with example two? I have a question for you then. This electron in example two, how do you suppose the electron got that speed? You just you know, go over to the cupboards in the physics lab and look for the jar that says electrons moving at 3.5 times 10 to the 6 meters per second, then open it up and grab an electron and let it go. How do we get an electron moving at a particular speed? The answer to that question is, by the way, of course, no, right? How do you get an electron moving at a particular speed? Because there's a way to get an electron moving at this speed or at any other speed we choose. You know, Craig? The um, uh, use of voltage. Right, the application of an accelerating voltage. Do you agree there's a connection between the accelerating voltage applied to an electron and the speed it reaches? Yeah? Do you agree there's a relationship between the speed of an electron and its de Broglie wavelength? Do you think there's a relationship between the de Broglie wavelength and the angle? Yes. So if it give you the angle, you ought to be able to work backwards and find the voltage. I roll, I know. But this is a one-two punch physics principle question. Electrons are accelerated by a potential difference of? We don't know. But what we do know is that they pass through the equivalent of a diffraction grating with this value of d and the n equals 2 image is at an angle of 11.5 degrees. We're asked for the accelerating voltage. So if we build our physics formulas here, the accelerating voltage is equal to the change in kinetic energy of the electron over the charge. And this formula that I'm going to show you, Q delta V equals 1 half mv squared, we've used dozens of times. What, where did the delta go on the EK?
Right. And, and if it doesn't say that, then it should. And it should. It should say electrons are accelerated from rest by a potential difference. I think this question is messy enough without having to worry about an initial energy. So what are we missing? Let's follow the yellow brick road here. What are we missing that's preventing us from finding the voltage, the speed? Well, we're talking about a de Broglie wavelength because the electrons are interfering in some bizarre way that we don't have to think about every time we do this problem. We don't. You don't have to, don't go down that rabbit hole and start imagining electrons going through openings. Just do the physics. Why can't we calculate the speed here? Because we don't know the wavelength. But I can use classical physics to find the wavelength. So I can find the wavelength using Young's double slit formula. Then I can use the wavelength to find the speed it's moving at using de Broglie's formula. Once I have that speed, I can find the voltage by using Q delta V equals a half mv squared. And I see many of you are already calculating this lambda. Uh, D is 5.2 multiplied by 10 to the negative 10 multiplied by sine of 11.5 divided by n of 2. So this is the wavelength, 5.18 times 10 to the negative 11. When you rearrange this formula that I've got my little bubble around for V, it becomes H over M lambda. Cross multiplying gives lambda MV equals H, so you divide by lambda and M. So what will I get for a speed? I need to take Planck's constant. Divide by the mass, it's an electron. It's not always an electron. In fact, is it an electron? Does it say electrons? Okay. And also divided by my wavelength. This is the speed. 1.41 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. That can go in here, and I can finish the problem off. 0.5 times the mass times that speed squared. This is the kinetic energy the electron has to have so that it's moving at the right speed, so that it has that wavelength, so that the n equals 2 is at 11.5 degrees. All I need to do is divide that kinetic energy by the charge, and I will get the accelerating voltage. So about 561 volts. Although I didn't ask this, I could follow it up with what two physics principles are used and in what order are they used. So let's grab our formula sheet. Anytime you use that voltage formula, everybody, what you are using is conservation of energy. So number five, and we've had a little bit of a conversation earlier in the year. I wouldn't cross out physics principle three, but I would never choose it. 
any place physics principle 3 applies, physics principle 5 applies. Physics principle 3 is included in 5. But there are also applications of conservation of energy, number 5, that are not number 3. So 5 is an umbrella that covers all energy. We use that last to find the voltage. What other physics principle do you suppose we used in order to eventually get the speed to find the voltage? Nine. Wave particle duality. Any time you use, everybody, any time you use this formula here, lambda equal, well, I'll write it this way, P equals H over lambda. Anytime you use that formula, you are using the principle of wave particle duality because you are either calculating the particle properties of a photon or the wave properties of a particle. So the answer to the two physics principle combination would be 9, 5. And now there are only two more physics principles that you haven't learned about, number 6 and number 8. But we will do that in the next unit. So that's it. That's the de Broglie wavelength lesson, and that's the end of the lesson. So for quantum particles, this is what happens when they pass through two openings. And I'll be posting this video, so if you need to look at some of the diagrams and the graphics again, they will be there. Look up here, this is where we started, right? Watch what happens, though. That's why that formula I had separate from the other, because it can be applied to photons or to particles with mass. All right, you got some problems to practice for tomorrow. And don't forget, a little quiz on the photoelectric effect tomorrow. You got about 20 minutes left in class here to work on this stuff.